Amara's hands pressed against the stranger's chest, each compression draining the last ounce of strength she had. Come on, don't die, she whispered, glancing at her mother standing frozen nearby, clutching their only bag of groceries. A crowd had gathered, their phones recording, but no one stepping forward. The man's face was pale, his lips faintly blue, his expensive suit now smudged with dirt and grass. A faint gasp escaped him, his eyes fluttering open for a moment to lock with hers, and then the park buzzed with life that morning. Children laughed near the playground. Joggers pounded the pavement, and the aroma of freshly brewed coffee wafted from a nearby cart. Amara Johnson, her wiry frame clad in an oversized hoodie and worn sneakers, sat cross-legged on the edge of the grass. Her sharp, observant eyes scanned the crowd while she gnawed on a stale crust of bread. Beside her, her mother, Janet, a woman in her early forties with deep lines etched into her caramel-toned face, rummaged through her frayed canvas bag, counting coins. Not even enough for milk, Janet muttered, shaking her head. Her voice was tight with exhaustion, the weight of their daily struggle pressing down on her shoulders. Amara tried to offer a reassuring smile. We'll figure something out, Mom. We always do. Janet forced a weak grin, but her eyes betrayed the despair she tried to hide. For years, they had been teetering on the edge of survival. With each day feeling like a battle, they were barely winning. As Amara stood to stretch, a commotion caught her attention. Near the fountain at the center of the park, a man in a crisp gray suit staggered, clutching his chest. He was older, perhaps in his mid-fifties, with silver hair that glinted in the sunlight. His face contorted in pain and he stumbled, crashing to his knees. Mom, look! Amara pointed. Before Janet could react, Amara was already sprinting toward the man. The bystanders froze, murmuring amongst themselves, but none stepped forward. Phones were raised, recording the scene, but no one moved to help. Amara dropped to her knees beside the man. Sir, can you hear me? She asked, her voice trembling. His eyes flickered open for a moment, glassy and unfocused, before closing again. He's not breathing. Amara's voice rose in panic. She had learned CPR during a community program at school and hoped she could remember enough to save him. Positioning her hands on his chest, she began compressions, counting aloud to steady her nerves. Come on, she pleaded. Don't die on me. Janet finally arrived, clutching their grocery bag tightly. Amara, what are you doing? Let someone else. No one else is doing anything. Amara snapped, her focus unwavering. Her hands pressed rhythmically against the man's chest. We can't just let him die. A small crowd had formed, their whispers and gasps creating a background hum of tension. The man's chest began to rise faintly, and he let out a shallow gasp. His eyes fluttered open briefly, locking onto Amara's determined gaze. You're going to be okay, she whispered, though her heart hammered with doubt. Moments later, the wail of an ambulance siren pierced the air. Paramedics pushed through the onlookers, taking over with professional efficiency. Amara stepped back, her chest heaving as she watched them load the man onto a stretcher. One of the paramedics turned to her. You saved his life, he said, his tone a mix of surprise and respect. Amara didn't respond. She glanced at Janet, whose expression was a mix of pride and worry. As the ambulance doors closed and the vehicle sped away, the crowd began to disperse, their interest waning now that the drama was over. Janet placed a hand on Amara's shoulder. You were brave, she said softly, but I hope this doesn't bring us trouble. Amara frowned. Trouble? Mom, I just did what anyone would do. Not everyone would risk getting involved, Janet replied, her voice tinged with bitterness especially not for someone like him. Amara didn't respond. She turned back toward the patch of grass where their belongings lay. The crowd may have moved on, but her mind couldn't shake the image of the man's pale face, the desperation in his fleeting gaze. Do you think he'll be okay? She asked, more to herself than to Janet. I don't know, baby. 
I just don't know. As they gathered their meager belongings and began to walk back to their apartment, Amara couldn't help but feel that her life, so predictable in its struggles, had just shifted in a way she couldn't yet understand. The air in their cramped apartment was thick with the aroma of beans simmering on the stove. Janet sat at the small, wobbly table, her hands busy sewing a tear in one of Amara's hoodies. Amara, however, was restless. She paced the room, glancing occasionally at the cracked window that overlooked the noisy street below. You've been jittery all day, Janet remarked, her voice steady but tinged with concern. What's on your mind, baby? Amara hesitated, then sank into the chair across from her mother. I keep thinking about him, the man in the park. I can't get his face out of my head. Do you think he's okay? Janet set down her needle and sighed. You did all you could, Amara. You saved his life. That's more than most people would have done. But what if that wasn't enough? Amara's voice wavered. What if he... A sharp knock at the door interrupted her. Mother and daughter exchanged wary glances. Visitors were rare and unannounced ones even more so. Stay here, Janet said firmly, rising to answer the door. She peered through the peephole and frowned, opening the door cautiously. She found a man in a dark suit, holding a leather briefcase. His polished shoes and neatly combed hair screamed wealth, something that felt entirely out of place in their building. Good afternoon, the man began, his voice smooth and formal. My name is Charles Greer. I'm an associate of Mr. Victor Hayes. Janet's eyes narrowed. Who? <laughs> Victor Hayes, the gentleman your daughter assisted in the park yesterday. Charles glanced past her, spotting Amara standing hesitantly in the background. May I come in? Mr. Hayes asked me to deliver a message personally. Janet hesitated, her instincts screaming caution. But Amara stepped forward, her curiosity overriding her mother's reservations. What does he want? She asked, her voice steady despite her racing heart. Charles offered a small smile. Mr. Hayes would like to meet you. He's currently recovering in the hospital, but he insisted I locate you and express his gratitude. Janet crossed her arms. We're not looking for handouts, Mr. Greer. We don't want trouble. Handouts. Charles's expression shifted to one of mild offense. Madam, Mr. Hayes isn't offering charity. He simply wishes to thank your daughter for saving his life. Amara's gaze flickered to her mother. Mom, maybe we should at least hear him out. Janet studied her daughter's hopeful expression and sighed. Fine, where do we go? Later that afternoon, Amara and Janet found themselves in a private hospital room. Victor Hayes lay propped against a mountain of pillows, his complexion still pale, but showing signs of recovery. His eyes lit up when he saw Amara. You, he said weakly his voice hoarse. You're the girl who saved me. Amara stepped closer, her nerves fluttering. I just did what I could. Victor managed a faint chuckle. What you could. You gave me a second chance at life. That's not something I can ever repay. You don't have to repay me, Amara replied quickly. I'm just glad you're okay. Victor's eyes softened as he studied her. What's your name? Amara Johnson, she said. And this is my mom, Janet. Victor nodded toward Janet. You've raised a remarkable young woman. Janet shifted uncomfortably, unsure how to respond. We're just glad you're recovering. Victor's gaze returned to Amara. I owe you my life, Amara. If there's anything you need, anything at all, just name it. Amara hesitated, glancing at her mother. Janet's expression was guarded. But Amara's stomach growled loudly, betraying their reality. Embarrassed, she looked away, but Victor caught the sound. His brow furrowed. Have you eaten? He asked, his tone suddenly serious. Amara's cheeks flushed. We're fine. No, you're not. Victor turned to Charles, who had been standing silently by the door. Charles, arrange for food to be delivered to their home immediately. That's really not necessary, Janet began, but Victor held up a hand. It is, he said firmly. 
I can't rest knowing the person who saved me is going hungry. Janet opened her mouth to argue, but stopped when she saw the sincerity in his eyes. Amara, meanwhile, felt a strange mix of relief and gratitude bubbling in her chest. For the first time in a long while, it felt like someone truly cared. Back in their apartment that evening, the table was laden with groceries. Fresh bread, fruit, canned goods, and even a carton of milk. Amara and Janet stared at the bounty in disbelief. Do you think he meant it? Amara asked as she unpacked the bags. About helping us? Janet sighed, her fingers grazing the edge of a loaf of bread. People like him don't usually pay attention to folks like us. But maybe, she paused, her voice softening. Maybe he's different. As they sat down to their first full meal in weeks, Amara couldn't help but wonder what might come next. She had no idea that this simple act of kindness would set off a chain of events that would change their lives forever. The morning sunlight streamed through the window of their small apartment, warming the modest space that still smelled faintly of last night's meal. Amara sat at the table, her pencil poised over a piece of paper as she worked on a school assignment. Her mind, however, kept drifting to the events of the past week. The visit to Victor Hayes' hospital room had felt surreal, like a scene from a movie rather than her life. The food he'd sent had been a blessing, but more than that, his genuine gratitude had left a mark on her. Earth to Amara, Janet said, snapping her fingers playfully in front of her daughter's face. You've been staring at that same math problem for ten minutes. Amara blinked and smiled sheepishly. Sorry, Mom. Just thinking. About him? Janet asked, her tone neutral, as she folded a freshly laundered shirt. Amara nodded. I keep wondering if we'll see him again. He said he wanted to help. But do you think he really meant it? Janet hesitated, then shrugged. It's hard to say. People like him live in a different world, Amara. Sometimes they mean well, but they don't always follow through. Before Amara could respond, a knock at the door interrupted their conversation. Janet stiffened, her protective instincts kicking in. Visitors were still a rarity. Stay here, Janet instructed, moving cautiously toward the door. Peering through the peephole, her brow furrowed. It's him, she whispered, her voice tinged with disbelief. Amara shot to her feet, her heart racing. Victor? Janet opened the door, revealing Victor Hayes standing in the hallway, leaning slightly on a sleek black cane. He looked healthier than he had in the hospital, though his pale complexion and the way he favored his left leg hinted at his recent ordeal. Charles Greer stood a step behind him, holding a folder. Good morning, Victor said warmly, his smile genuine. I hope I'm not intruding. Janet opened the door wider, still processing the unexpected visit. Uh, no. Please come in. Victor stepped inside, his eyes scanning the modest space. Despite its worn furniture and peeling paint, the apartment exuded warmth, a testament to Janet's care and Amara's spirit. He turned to Amara, his smile broadening. There you are, he said. I've been thinking about you, young lady. Amara flushed, unsure how to respond. It's good to see you again, Mr. Hayes. Please call me Victor, he replied, waving a hand. I wanted to thank you again, and I have something I'd like to discuss with both of you. Janet gestured to the table. Have a seat. Victor eased himself into a chair, while Charles remained standing, clutching the folder. Amara, Victor began, folding his hands, your courage saved my life. That's not something I can ever repay, but I'd like to try. I want to help your family. Janet raised an eyebrow, her skepticism evident. Help us how? Victor glanced at Charles, who stepped forward and opened the folder, revealing a stack of documents. Mr. Hayes has established a trust in your daughter's name, Charles explained. It's a scholarship fund that will cover her education through college. Amara's eyes widened. A scholarship? But I'm only 14. It's never too early to invest in someone's future, Victor said. This fund will ensure that when the time comes, you'll have every opportunity to pursue your dreams. Janet's expression softened, but she remained cautious. 
That's very generous. But why go to such lengths? Victor met her gaze, his tone serious. Because I've lived my life focused on building wealth, often at the expense of seeing the humanity around me. Amara reminded me of something I'd forgotten. Kindness matters. If I can help her achieve her potential, it's the least I can do. Amara's heart swelled with a mix of gratitude and disbelief. Thank you, she whispered. This means so much. Victor smiled. That's not all. Charles, the second document, please. Charles handed Janet another sheet of paper. Mr. Hayes has also arranged for your apartment to be renovated at no cost to you. It's a temporary solution, but we want to ensure you're living in a safe and comfortable environment. Janet stared at the paper, her eyes misting. I, I don't know what to say. Say yes, Victor urged gently. Let me do this. Janet hesitated. But when she looked at Amara's hopeful face, her resolve wavered. Okay, she said quietly. Thank you. Over the next few weeks, the changes Victor set in motion began to take shape. Contractors arrived to repair the apartment's crumbling walls and leaky plumbing. A Mara school counselor, informed of the scholarship, arranged for tutoring sessions to help her excel in her studies. Janet, meanwhile, found herself warming to Victor, her initial distrust giving way to genuine gratitude. Victor visited often, bringing books for Amara and groceries for the family. He shared stories of his life, revealing a lonely childhood and a relentless drive to succeed that had left him isolated despite his wealth. Amara, in turn, shared her dreams of becoming a teacher, her eyes lighting up as she spoke. One evening, as they sat together in the newly painted living room, Victor turned to Janet. You've raised an incredible daughter, he said. Her strength and compassion inspire me. Janet smiled, her walls finally crumbling. She inspires me too. As Victor prepared to leave, he paused at the door. I've been thinking, he said. This might sound unusual, but I'd like to invite you both to dinner at my home. It's a chance for us to celebrate all that's been accomplished and to discuss the future. Amara's eyes sparkled with excitement, but Janet hesitated. Are you sure? We wouldn't want to impose. You're not imposing, Victor insisted. You're family now. The word hung in the air, filling the room with warmth. For the first time in years, Amara and Janet felt a glimmer of hope, a sense that their struggles might finally be behind them. Victor Hayes' home was nothing like Amara or Janet had ever seen. Nestled in the quiet opulence of an upscale neighborhood on the Upper East Side, the townhouse exuded understated elegance. Its facade of pale limestone gleamed under the streetlights as their cab pulled up to the curb. Amara stared in awe, her wide eyes drinking in the manicured shrubs, wrought iron railings, and towering windows that hinted at a world vastly different from her own. Janet, however, shifted uneasily in her seat. Are you sure this is the right place? She asked the driver, her voice tinged with disbelief. It's the address you gave me. The driver replied with a shrug. He helped them unload a small bag, though neither had packed more than the essentials for the dinner invitation. Amara clutched a neatly wrapped book, a thank you gift she'd picked out for Victor. Before they could knock, the door swung open and Victor greeted them with a warm smile. Dressed in a casual sweater and slacks, he looked worlds away from the man they had first met in the park. Welcome, he said, gesturing for them to come inside. I'm so glad you could make it. Amara stepped forward eagerly, while Janet followed more hesitantly, her gaze darting around the foyer. The interior of the house was even more breathtaking. Polished hardwood floors, high ceilings adorned with intricate moldings, and walls lined with art that looked as though it belonged in a museum. A crystal chandelier cast a soft glow over the space, and the air carried a faint scent of fresh flowers. This is beautiful, Amara said, her voice filled with wonder. Victor chuckled. Thank you. It's home, but it hasn't felt this alive in years. He led them to a cozy sitting room where a fire crackled in the hearth. Charles Greer was already waiting. Though tonight, he seemed more relaxed, holding a glass of wine 
and chatting with a woman who introduced herself as Victor's personal chef. Dinner was a feast unlike anything Janet or Amara had ever experienced. Course after course arrived, each dish more exquisite than the last. Amara tried everything, her delight evident with each bite, while Janet ate sparingly, her wariness still lingering. As the meal wound down, Victor leaned back in his chair, his expression thoughtful. I wanted tonight to be more than just a dinner, he began, looking from Janet to Amara. It's a chance for us to get to know each other better, to build trust. I hope you feel at home here. Amara nodded enthusiastically. It's amazing. Thank you so much for inviting us. Janet, however, met his gaze with a quiet intensity. This is all very generous, Victor, but I can't help wondering why us? Why go to so much trouble? Victor sighed, his smile fading. I understand your skepticism, Janet. The truth is, your daughter reminded me of someone I lost, a sister who was the kindest soul I've ever known. She believed in helping others, no matter the cost. Amara's bravery brought back those memories, and I felt compelled to honor that. Janet studied him for a long moment before nodding. I appreciate your honesty. Over the next few weeks, Victor's involvement in their lives deepened. He arranged for Amara to visit museums and attend enrichment programs, broadening her horizons in ways she had never imagined. Janet, meanwhile, began receiving calls from local businesses offering her job opportunities. Quiet gestures from Victor, though he never mentioned them outright. But not everything was seamless. The stark contrast between their worlds became increasingly evident. At one of Amara's tutoring sessions, a wealthy parent glanced at Janet's worn coat and whispered something to another mother. The sting of their judgment was sharp, though Janet pretended not to notice. Amara, however, caught the exchange and felt her cheeks burn with embarrassment and anger. Mom, she said later as they walked home, do you think we'll ever fit in? Janet gave her a sad smile. We don't need to fit in, Amara. We just need to be ourselves. Victor, too, faced challenges. His affluent friends raised eyebrows at his newfound association with the Johnsons. At a charity gala, one of his business partners leaned in and asked, Why are you wasting your time with them? Surely there are more productive ways to give back. Victor's jaw tightened. Amara saved my life, he said curtly. That's not something I take lightly. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, Victor invited Janet and Amara to join him on a walk through Central Park. The air was crisp and the leaves rustled softly in the breeze. They stopped at a bench near the fountain where Amara had first saved him. This spot, Victor said, his voice tinged with emotion, is where everything changed for me. I've spent so much of my life focused on building wealth, but it's moments like this that truly matter. Janet nodded, her own defenses finally crumbling. I think we've all changed, she admitted. You've given us more than we ever thought possible. Victor smiled, and you've given me hope. That's worth more than anything money can buy. As they sat together, the city lights twinkling in the distance, a sense of peace settled over them. For the first time in years, their futures felt bright. The rhythm of their new lives had begun to settle. Victor's presence in Amara and Janet's world brought stability, a strange sense of belonging that neither had dared to hope for. The repaired apartment, the opportunities for Amara, and the subtle but significant support for Janet's independence created a foundation they hadn't experienced in years. Yet under the surface, there were ripples, Questions that lingered and emotions that remained unresolved. One crisp fall afternoon, Amara found herself back at Victor's townhouse, this time alone. Victor had invited her to choose books from his extensive library, promising her that they were hers to keep. She wandered through the shelves, running her fingers over the spines of leather-bound volumes and colorful paperbacks. You have more books than our local library, she remarked with a laugh pulling down a thick volume on astronomy. Victor, sitting nearby in a plush armchair, smiled. Books were my escape growing up. I wanted to create a space where anyone could feel at home with them. Amara flipped through the pages, her brow furrowing as she studied the pictures of galaxies 
and consolations. You had all this, and yet you were lonely? Victor nodded, his smile fading. Money doesn't shield you from loneliness. In some ways, it makes it worse. It's hard to know who's genuine. Amara closed the book, her expression thoughtful. I guess I never thought someone like you could feel that way. You seem untouchable, like nothing could hurt you. Victor leaned forward, his tone gentle. We all carry pain, Amara. The difference is how we choose to let it shape us. Meanwhile, Janet found herself navigating her own challenges. The subtle judgment she encountered in Victor's world left her feeling exposed, but the job offers he had facilitated gave her a renewed sense of purpose. She eventually accepted a position at a small bakery owned by one of Victor's friends. It wasn't glamorous, but it was honest work, and it gave her the confidence to begin envisioning a future beyond survival. One evening, as she closed the bakery, Janet was startled to see a familiar face waiting outside. It was Charles Greer, holding a small box tied with a ribbon. Charles, she asked surprised. What are you doing here? He handed her the box. Mr. Hayes asked me to deliver this. It's a token of appreciation. Janet opened the box to find a delicate bracelet. Its charm engraved with the initials AJ, a clear nod to Amara. Her throat tightened. This is too much, she murmured. Charles smiled. Victor doesn't think so. He values what you and Amara have brought into his life. Janet's grip on the box tightened as conflicting emotions surged within her. Gratitude mixed with unease, and she found herself wondering if their bond with Victor was becoming too deep, too complicated. The tension came to a head one evening when Victor invited them to a dinner with a few of his close friends. Janet had hesitated but ultimately agreed, knowing that Victor's intentions were genuine. The evening started well enough. Amara charmed the room with her curiosity and wit, while Janet remained reserved but polite. However, as the night wore on, one guest, a sleek, impeccably dressed woman named Eleanor, made a comment that sent a chill through the room. It's lovely that you've taken them under your wing, Victor, Eleanor said, her tone dripping with condescension. It's so charitable of you. Janet stiffened, her cheeks burning. Amara, sitting beside her, clenched her fists under the table. Victor's expression darkened. Eleanor, he said sharply, this isn't charity. Amara and Janet are my friends. They've brought more value to my life than most people I know. Eleanor blinked, clearly startled by his tone. Of course, Victor. I didn't mean to offend. The rest of the evening passed in a strained silence. When they returned to their apartment, Janet finally let her guard down, tears streaming down her face. I don't belong in his world, she said, her voice trembling. No matter how hard I try, I'll always feel like an outsider. Amara hugged her mother tightly. You belong wherever you want to be, Mom. Don't let people like her make you feel otherwise. The following day, Victor arrived unannounced, concern etched across his face. Janet Amara... He began, his voice heavy with emotion. I owe you both an apology. Last night was unacceptable. It wasn't your fault, Janet replied, though her tone was weary. But it was, Victor insisted. I invited you into a space that wasn't welcoming, and I failed to protect you from that. I'm sorry. Janet studied him for a long moment, then nodded. Thank you for saying that. Victor hesitated, then added. I've been doing a lot of thinking. I want to offer you more than just financial support. I want to build something lasting, something that ensures you both have the opportunities you deserve. What do you mean? Amara asked, her curiosity peaked. Victor smiled, though his eyes were misty. I've started drafting plans for a community center, a place where kids like you, Amara, can explore their potential. Where families like yours, Janet, can find support. It'll be named after someone who inspired it all. Amara Johnson. Amara's jaw dropped. You're naming it after me? Victor nodded. Your courage changed my life, Amara. It's only fitting that your name represents the hope and kindness that Center will stand for. 
Janet's eyes filled with tears, but this time, they were tears of gratitude and pride. For the first time, she allowed herself to believe that their bond with Victor wasn't just an act of charity. It was the beginning of something transformative for them all. The ribbon-cutting ceremony for the Amara Johnson Community Center was held on a bright spring morning. The air was alive with anticipation, the crowd buzzing with excitement. Amara stood at the center of it all, wearing a simple but elegant dress that Victor had gifted her for the occasion. She shifted nervously, her hands clutching the pair of oversized scissors meant to symbolize the official opening. You'll do great, Victor whispered, placing a reassuring hand on her shoulder. His presence was calm and steady, a contrast to her jittery energy. Janet stood beside her, her face glowing with pride, dressed in a smart blouse and slacks, a far cry from her usual worn clothing. She looked every bit the confident woman she had grown into over the past few months. She caught Amara's eye and nodded, silently encouraging her. The mayor of the city stepped forward, his speech brief but heartfelt. He praised the center as a beacon of hope, a place where underprivileged families could find resources, education, and support. Then, he handed the microphone to Amara. Swallowing her nerves, Amara stepped forward. The sea of faces blurred as she began to speak. When I met Mr. Hayes, I didn't think I was doing anything special. I just wanted to help someone in need. But that small act of kindness changed my life in ways I never imagined. This center isn't just about me. It's about everyone here. It's a place where kindness, courage, and hard work come together to create something beautiful. The crowd erupted into applause as she cut the ribbon, officially opening the center. Tears welled in her eyes as she glanced at Victor, who smiled proudly, his eyes glistening with emotion. The weeks that followed were a whirlwind of activity. The community center became a hub of life and energy. Children attended after-school programs. Adults found job training and counseling, and families gathered for events that fostered a sense of belonging. Amara volunteered as often as she could, tutoring younger kids and organizing book drives. The center became her sanctuary, a place where she could give back to the community that had shaped her. Janet also found a new sense of purpose. She began working as a coordinator at the center, using her experiences to guide other single mothers through their struggles. She often marveled at how far they had come, from the edge of despair to a position where they could help others. Victor, too, found himself transformed. His once lonely mansion became a gathering place for Amara and Janet, who often joined him for meals and long conversations. He reveled in the warmth of their company, feeling a sense of family he hadn't known in years. One evening, as they sat together on the steps of the community center, Victor turned to Amara. You know, he began, his voice soft. This place might have my resources behind it, but it's heart. It's all you. Amara tilted her head, puzzled. What do you mean? You inspired this, he explained. Your courage and kindness reminded me of what's important. You didn't just save my life that day in the park. You gave me a reason to live it better. Amara's eyes filled with tears. I never thought I'd hear something like that. I just wanted to help. And that's why it's so powerful, Victor said. You never asked for anything in return, yet you created something that will change countless lives. Janet, sitting beside them, placed a hand on Amara's. He's right, baby. What you've done, what we've done, it's more than I ever dreamed possible. They sat in silence for a while, watching as the last rays of sunlight bathed the city in gold. The laughter of children playing in the distance filled the air, a testament to the life they had helped cultivate. Months later, as the center continued to thrive, Amara received news that brought everything full circle. She had been nominated for a citywide award recognizing young leaders who made a difference in their communities. When she stood on stage to accept the award, she looked out at the audience and saw Victor and Janet in the front row, beaming with pride. This isn't just my award, Amara said, her voice steady despite the lump in her throat. It belongs to everyone who believed in me, my mom, who taught me to be strong, Mr. Hayes, who gave me a chance, 
and the community that inspires me every day. Kindness is more powerful than we realize. It can change lives. I know, because it changed mine as they walked home that night. The cool breeze carrying the sounds of the bustling city. Janet slipped her arm around Amara's shoulders. You've come a long way, kid, she said, her tone a mix of affection and awe. We all have, Amara replied, glancing at Victor, who walked beside them, his cane tapping lightly against the pavement. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. Victor chuckled. Neither would I. For the first time in their lives, they weren't just surviving. They were thriving. And it all started with one small act of kindness.